Galatians chapter 4. I have a, a threefold purpose in preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I feel that every true God sent, God anointed preacher of the gospel will have this threefold purpose and objective in view. Number one, it's to glorify God. Noah preached 120 years with no success, but he glorified God. Judson preached seven years in Burma with hardly a move on the part of the natives, but he preached to glorify God. So whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do it for God's glory, to glorify his majesty. He's God, and he must be preached to glorify his righteousness, his holiness, his mercy, his love, his truth, and to magnify and exalt his blessed Son. That's what the design of redemption is all about, that in the ages to come he might show forth the riches, the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So we're not here to win souls primarily. We're not here to reach the world for Jesus primarily. And notice I said primarily. But we're here to glorify God. If it's in days of famine or if it's in days of feast, if it's day in days of plenty or if in days of poverty, if it's in success or failure, we're here to glorify God. And that's our first motive. That's our first objective, to glorify God. But secondly, that men might come to know the living God in the face of Christ Jesus in a true and saving interest. Paul talked about the sufferings which he endured because of preaching the gospel and he said, I don't, I don't mind them. I don't count my life dear unto myself. I endure all things for the elect's sake. I endure whatever I have to endure. I go wherever I have to go. I preach to whomever God leads me to preach for the elect's sake, that they might also obtain the salvation which is in Jesus Christ with eternal glory. That's, he said, the second reason why I preach that the elect might come to know the gospel, that they might come to receive Christ. But thirdly, we have a threefold purpose, I said. We have a threefold objective. And thirdly, that those who know Christ, that those who already rest in Christ, that those who have a saving interest in Christ, that those who have faith in the Redeemer, whether it's little faith or great faith, whether it's some faith or not much faith, but those who have faith in Christ, we preach that they might grow, that they might be comforted, that they might grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ. Our Lord said to Peter, Feed my sheep. When Paul was bidding farewell to the elders of the church there at Antioch or Ephesus, he said, Feed the flock of God. Feed the flock of God. Minister to them the word of God, that they might be assured of their interest in Christ that they might grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. You cannot grow in Christ. You cannot grow in grace. You may have faith. You may have an interest in Christ. You may have a saving interest in Christ. But it will not grow without the Word of God. The Word of God must be preached that we might grow in grace, in the knowledge of Christ, in assurance, in the fruit of the Spirit and that we might enjoy what is ours to enjoy. And that is the peace that passeth understanding. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Christ said, You come to me, I'll give you rest. He said, We have ceased from our labors and entered into his rest. How many of you can really say that? Not a whole lot of us, can we? But we ought to be able to. We have ceased from our labors and entered into his rest. Our Lord said, I will send you a comforter. But how many of us really know what the comfort of the Word of God means, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, what it means? And, and I lay the blame on the shoulders of today's preachers more than on the people themselves. 
The Word of God is to be preached to glorify God, yes, to reach men with the gospel, but we're to feed God's sheep. We're to give them God's Word. We're to give them those portions of Scripture that will provide them a place for their feet in slippery places, a rock to build on, a refuge in which to hide, a shelter in a dry and weary land, a a fountain in a dry and famine-infested land. They need to hear this Word. But they're not hearing it. And all of these purposes are my aim, and I think all will be fulfilled in this message tonight, but especially the latter. And that is that you might grow in assurance, that you might grow in the fruit of the Spirit, that you might find that rest that Christ promised, and that peace that he said, I give. Peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid, that you might really know what it means to be comforted in Christ. Now, that's my objective. Now, it may be this message will be preached in many places by tape. And it may be that some indifferent, some careless professor of religion will hear this message and lay claim to a false peace and to idle comfort, but it's not right to hold back the refreshing rain because it makes the weeds to grow too. You see what I'm saying? The rain from heaven brings forth the wheat, but it also makes tares grow. The rain from heaven comes down upon the field, and as a result of that rain, the wheat will grow and and get healthy, but also the, the weeds do too. And so it may be that, that this message will be preached somewhere and some person who does not really know Christ, but who has a false refuge and a person who's indifferent to the claims of Christ, but yet through an easy believism decision he lays some kind of claim to salvation. And he may, he may get some strength from this, and he may grow in his refuge of lies, but that's, that's not our fault. We have to preach the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. And you know Paul, Paul preached grace abounding over sin so convincingly. Now watch this. Paul preached the free grace of God, grace abounding over sin so convincingly, so powerfully, that some men were made to exclaim, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He must have preached a mighty strong grace message. Because there were people who came to him and said, Paul, were you you insinuating that uh, the more we sin, the more God's grace is glorified? Were you saying that we should go on in sin and that way we'd be partakers of God's grace? That's how convincingly Paul preached the grace of God. But I know this, I know this, and I know it from being a pastor for 31 years almost. I know this from personal experience. I know this from having read this book. I know that there are some true believers, people who know God, people who know Christ, people who are believers in the grace of God and the gospel of Christ, who know themselves to be sinners without any ability to save themselves, that salvation wholly and totally and completely is the gift of God by the grace of God through the work of Christ. They know that, and yet they they don't have this peace. They don't have this rest and joy and comfort. They keep themselves in bondage. They keep themselves in bondage to the law. They keep themselves in bondage to a personal righteousness that they're trying to attain. That's right. They know Christ. They know Christ. But they're filled with so many doubts and so many fears. And this is one of the problems right here. And I'm going to hit it hard tonight. They're trying to worship God in the letter of the law instead of in the spirit of the law. They're trying to hold to the oldness of the law instead of the newness of the Spirit. And this is what Paul is talking about over here in Romans. Let me show you something. Turn to Romans chapter 7. Romans 7, verse 5 and 6. And listen to Paul. He says in Romans 7, verse 5 and 6, When we, for when we were in the flesh, before we were saved, before we were born again, before we met Christ, 
The motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we're delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve God in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. That's not how we worship God. Not in the oldness of the letter, not in rules and regulations and laws and ordinances and ceremonies and rituals. That's not how you worship God. It may be you keep a day. It may be you'll be guided by instructions and laws. It may be that you'll follow an ordinance as the ordinance of baptism in the Lord's table. But we don't worship God in the letter of the law, in the oldness of the letter. We worship God in newness of spirit. It's spiritual communion. Turn to 2 Corinthians, if you will, chapter 3. Listen to this verse over here. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is again saying almost the same thing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, look at this verse here. Not that we're sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. Spurgeon said, Paul saying that we're not sufficient to think anything that has to be revealed. Think anything by ourselves. Everything I know God taught me. Everything I know God taught me. I'm not sufficient to think anything by myself. I'm not sufficient to think anything from myself. I don't expect anything out of me. Every good gift and perfect gift cometh from above. I don't expect, I'm not sufficient to think any good thing will ever come from me. In the flesh dwelleth no good thing. And I'm not sufficient to think any good thing of me. I'm still a sinner saved by grace, the chief of sinners, less than the least of all the saints. Let not a man think too highly of himself, to think himself something when he's nothing, Paul said. I'm not one whit behind the chief apostle, but I'm nothing, he said. So I'm not sufficient to think anything by myself, or from myself, or of myself. But, look at the next line, but our sufficiency is of God. That's where it all comes from. That's where my righteousness comes from. That's where I please the Father through the Son. That's where my acceptance comes from. That's where my wisdom, my righteousness, my sanctification, my, my redemption, my acceptance, my, my salvation, my uh, perseverance, my preservation, my ultimate perfection. It's all from God. Our sufficiency is of God. I am not sufficient to think anything by myself because I'm dumb, stupid, and ignorant. I know nothing. I know nothing. And when a man thinks he knows something, he knows nothing as he ought to know what the Scripture said. It's all from God. And I'm not sufficient to think anything from myself. The only product this old human nature ever produced is evil. If there's any producing of righteousness, it didn't come from me, it came from Christ. Nor am I sufficient to think anything by myself, from myself, or of myself. But my sufficiency is Christ. All right. Who, hath, who also hath made us, he made us able ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter. That's not our message. You do this, you do that, you do the other, and God will accept you. That's not our message. What is our message? It's a message of the Spirit. For the letter does what? It destroys, it kills, but the Spirit gives life. I know people whose household of faith are in constant turmoil. Their households of faith, they know Christ. It is a house of faith. Too often ministers are ready to say, well, you're just not saved. That's not true. That's not true. They know Christ. They love Christ. They believe Christ. But their households of faith are in turmoil and trouble. Why? I'll tell you why. And this will help you tonight. I've been there. They're trying to raise two boys in the same house who can't be raised together. Ishmael and Isaac can't live together. Can't live together. That's the reason this scripture that Charlie read, look at it down here in verse 30, Galatians 4. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture?
cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. He's got to go. Cast out the bondwoman. Abraham had to do it. I've got to do it. You've got to do it. And her son. Brother Mayan, that doesn't mean a thing to me yet. Well, give me another few minutes. I believe it will mean something. I'll tell you this, it'll change your whole thinking if, you, if you'll get a hold of it. Your whole thinking. It'll change your attitude and everything. Cast out the bondwoman. All right, where did this come from? Right, let's look at the household of Abraham. Back in verse 22, it is written, Galatians 4, 22. Abraham had two sons. One by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. Now, you know the story. How that God came to Abraham when he was 85, 86, something like that. And he said, I'm going to make of you a great nation, a great people. I'm going to bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. And through you all the nations will be blessed. You'll have a people as the stars of the sky and as the sands of the seashore. He didn't even have a child. Never had had a child. He was married to Sarah. They never had a child. But God says to this man, you're going to have a son, and through that son, you're going to have a people of faith, God's people. And so Abraham and Sarah believed God. But Sarah got impatient. And I guess Abraham did too. And so she said to Abraham, she said, I have a handmaid by the name of Hagar. She's called A-G-A-R here, Agar, but it's Hagar. It's evident I'm not going to have any children. Sarah was 76. So she said, why don't you go into my handmaid, Hagar, take her to wife, and bring forth a son. So Abraham did just that. He went into Hagar, and she conceived and bare a son. They called his name Ishmael. This wasn't the son of promise. Hagar was a slave. She was a bondwoman. She was a mistress. She was not a free woman. She was not Abraham's wife. She was not the one God designated to bear the child. It was just a son of flesh. That's all Ishmael was, a son of flesh, all he ever could be. Born of a slave, born of a bondwoman. He was a child of the flesh. He was a child that Abraham conceived or begat, and Hagar conceived and brought forth, and that's all he'll ever be. But Abraham loved him. Abraham loved him. Can't you imagine that man, 80? six years old, and that little fella came into his home, and uh, my, my, the joy and delight, that was his only son. He didn't have any more children. That was it. All the attention was focused on, on Ishmael. Ishmael, he was a, he was a, a good-looking lad, rugged, strong. Well, when, when Ishmael was 14 years old, Ishmael had been in that home, Cecil, 14 years. When Abraham was a hundred, now, God, God doesn't get in a hurry like we do. We want everything done right now. But God, in his own time, does what he pleases to do. He works his sovereign will in his own good time. In the fullness of time, God does what he promises. And when, he, when Abraham was a hundred, Sarah was ninety, and Ishmael, this beloved son, this child of the flesh, though, was fourteen. God came and said, All right, Abraham, I'm ready to send that son I promised you. But Lord, won't Ishmael do? Oh, Ishmael's your boy. Ishmael's a product of your flesh. Ishmael's something you did. It's not something I did. Ishmael is the son of the bondwoman. Ishmael is a, sl a slave. He never will be anything but that. Sarah, thy wife, shall conceive and bear a son. And she did. And she did. She brought forth a son by the name of Isaac. All right, now watch this. Here is Ishmael, 15 years old now. And here's this new baby, new boy. This is the son of promise. This is not a slave. This is not a, a child of bondage. This is not a child of flesh. This is a miracle child. This child was born from a dead womb. Only God could do this. Abraham didn't have anything to do with this. Sarah didn't have anything to do with this. This was the gift of God. This was a miracle child. This was, a, this was God's hand and only God's hand. And Abraham knew it and Sarah knew it and everybody else knew it. And Ishmael knew it. 
And Abraham was a wealthy man, influential man, a powerful man. And everything that he had, and a man a hundred years old, and everything he had was going to Isaac. And Ishmael knew that. And you can imagine the turmoil in that home. You can imagine the conflict in that home. On the part of Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, she figured Ishmael was going to be the heir too. After all, he's 15 years old. And this old man was 100 years old. And his wife was 90. Who in the world ever expect them to have a child? She was grooming Ishmael to take over. He was going to be the wealthy, influential, powerful man who stepped into Abraham's shoes. Ishmael thought that too. But here comes this child of promise from God. And that left him out. And, 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 and it, it, it all belonged to Isaac, Sarah's son, because he was the rightful heir. He was the one God designated. And so turn to Genesis 21. Let's see what happened. Genesis 21, verse 9. And Sarah, they, they put on a big feast when they weaned the child. When he was eight or nine months old or so, they weaned him, and he put on a big feast. And verse 9, Genesis 21, And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking, laughing. He didn't like Isaac. He didn't like him. He hated him. And he, got, he was laughing at him. Now read on, verse 10, Genesis 21. Genesis 21, 10. And wherefore she said, Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. It is not possible. Cast out this bondwoman and her son. It is impossible for these two to live together. It is impossible for us to have any peace or rest. As long as Ishmael's here, Ishmael has got to go. Hagar has got to go. Not put out on the North 40 in a little building just outside the big house, but out completely. They cannot survive together. They cannot exist together. They cannot live together. Ishmael, the son of flesh, and Isaac, the son of promise, cannot live on the same property. Now then, this is our reason. This is the reason for so many of our conflicts and our doubts and our fears and our turmoil and our lack of peace and lack of joy and lack of faith is we have not yet cast out the bondwoman and her son. We had not done it yet. We've taken Isaac in. That's Christ. We believed Isaac is the heir. We believed Isaac is the way. We believe Isaac is the son of promise. But we still keep that Ishmael. We kill, still keep that son of the flesh. We still keep that son of the bondwoman hanging around. And we're having turmoil and conflict between these two people. Grace and works cannot share one house. Law and mercy cannot share one house. My righteousness and his righteousness cannot exist side by side. The letter of the law and the spirit of the law cannot walk together. I cannot rest totally and completely in Christ and try at the same time to please God in my flesh. I cannot make Isaac, Christ, the sole heir, give him the sole preeminence, give him all the affection, and keep Ishmael around to mock him and rob me of my happiness. Ishmael's got to go. Because as long as Ishmael stays around, he's going to be around the corner mocking. He's going to be around the corner laughing. Here they are, Isaac, the son of promise. The miracle of God has come. Something that Abraham couldn't do and Sarah couldn't do and nobody else could do, but God did. And here's the heir. Here's the child of promise. Here's the miracle child, the child of grace. And everybody's attention is upon him, and everybody's rejoicing in him, and everybody thanks God for him, and everybody looks forward to the day when he'll be full grown and take his father's throne. There stands Ishmael. And he messes up the whole situation. He makes Sarah uncomfortable. He makes Abraham uncomfortable. 
He makes the people around uncomfortable. And there he stands peeping around the corner laughing, laughing, laughing. And that's what's going on inside of you. Christ has come and given you a new nature. He's coming by the miracle of His grace. He's given you, born within, a, a, a new person, the Son of God. Christ has come to live and to give you a, a, a blessed hope in Him. And He has stepped in to reign and to rule and to give you peace and joy and rest and happiness and fulfillment and sanctification and acceptance with God until one of these days He makes you just like Himself and all the victories completely won and you rejoice and I rejoice and everybody rejoices. But around the corner is my righteousness and my pride. And all these other things that go to make up human nature, the flesh, you know, that son of the flesh, that child of the flesh, that product of the human heart. He hasn't been cast out. He's still allowed to stay around. He's still allowed, free, allowed freedom of the place. He's still allowed to make his own way through the place. And as long as he's there, I'm not going to have the happiness and joy and peace and tranquility and Christ Isaac's not going to have the preeminence. He's going to keep robbing him of the preeminence. People are going to keep looking to him, you know, and watching him and listening to him and see what he has to say about it. And as long as he stays around, as long as my flesh and my works and my efforts to please God in this flesh and keep laws and follow letters of laws and rules of law and rules of preachers and rules of Scripture to find acceptance with God, I'm not going to find it in Christ. So what I've got to do is get rid of him. Throw him off the place. And not have anything else to do with him. That was hard. That was hard on Abraham. And it's going to be hard on you. You know Abraham loved that boy, 15 years old. They were all walking in the woods together. They'd been together for 15 years. Here this new child was brand new. He didn't know this new, he'd never, probably never held this new one. But that boy, he'd set him on his knee and told him stories about the past and told him all the things that he had learned from God and, and, and about the great, about his daddy's house down there in Ur of the Chaldees and all those things. And now here he stands and, and he says to Hagar and to, and to Ishmael, here's your bottle of water and some bread. Get gone. Don't come back. You can't, you can't reign with Isaac. Isaac's got to have the preeminence. Oh, that's hard. We like to see our name down in print, you know. That's old Ishmael. We like somebody to pat us on the back and say, it's a pretty prayer you prayed. That's Ishmael. We like somebody to come around and, and say, I sure appreciate you doing this, that, and the other, and, and I appreciate your faithfulness in church, your regularity, and your loyalty to Christ. Old Ishmael, he, he peeping around that lad. That envy and pride and personal recognition and ambition and, and all these things, that, that's Ishmael. He's not gone yet. He's still down there in, in the pasture somewhere. And every once in a while he pokes his head out and, and, and calls attention to himself. My sufficiency is Christ. My hope is Christ. My righteousness is Christ. It's not me. Tomorrow may be a bitter day. It may be a disappointing day. It may be a fumbling, stumbling day. But Ishmael's still gone. Christ is my hope. He's my mercy, my grace, my wisdom, my righteousness, and everything. He's the king. He's the heir. It's all in him. Ishmael's gone. Let me show you the reason for that now. Right quick, turn to Galatians 4 again. Look at these two women. He says in verse 23, Ishmael was the, of the bondwoman born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was but promise. Now verse 24, which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, which gendered to bondage, gendered to bondage, which is Hagar. And this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, an answer to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Now here's what he's saying simply. Listen to me. The two women... Hagar, Sarah. Hagar is the covenant of works. That's who Hagar represents. Hagar represents this command, this do and live. 
Did you notice the first verse Charlie read? Tell me, you that want to be under the law. Don't you hear the law? Don't you know what the law requires? This salvation by works that you are so anxious to adopt, do you know what it means? It means perfection. Birth, nature, practice, choice, conversation, imagination, as holy as God. That's what it requires. And Hagar represents that law, that covenant of works. Sarah represents the covenant of grace. Gift of God, mercy of God, love of God, all in Christ. Christ has done it. Christ has fulfilled it. We live because Christ obeyed the law for us. We have a righteousness because he fulfilled it for us. We have forgiveness because he paid the debt. We have cleansing because his blood was shed. We have acceptance because he intercedes for us. It's all of grace. The covenant of works is all of flesh, all of works. You do this and live. The covenant of grace has no flesh in it. It has no response in it. It has no obedience in it on our part. It's without the law. It's the gift of God in Christ. That's the covenant of grace. That's what Sarah rep She didn't do anything to produce this child. She was dead. God produced it. She was passive in it. God made her live. All right, notice this. Sarah was the first wife of Abraham. Oh, this is interesting. Sarah was the first wife of Abraham. She is the covenant of grace. Are you with me? The covenant of grace was first. She came before Hagar. Now, Hagar represents the covenant of works. But Sarah came before Hagar. She was the wife of Abraham before Hagar was ever born. So... In eternity past, God made a covenant of grace in Christ to redeem you. To redeem you. But now Hagar gave birth to the first child. Sarah was the first wife. She was the wife before Hagar was born. But Hagar brought forth the first son. The covenant of works brought forth the first son too. His name was Adam. His name was Adam. And in him we died. And then along came Sarah. And brought forth the miracle child. Along came the covenant of grace. After the son of flesh was born. After the son of our own efforts was born. After we'd fallen in sin. God came along through Sarah. And gave the son of promise. And he came along through Mary the virgin. And gave Christ the son of promise. The child of the covenant. The child of the covenant. All right. When the child of the covenant comes, when the miracle child's born, the other one's got to go. He can't be an heir with him. He can't survive with him. He can't live with him. He can't abide with him. He can't reign with him. He's got to go. And Adam would die. And Christ would made alive. As we born the image of the earthy, thank God we put that aside and we'll bear the image of the heavenly. We've tried at one time to be saved by our own efforts. It didn't work. God came along, gave us a new nature in Christ, and gave us everything freely by grace. Now then, turn your back on that old nature, and that old flesh, and that old man, and tell him goodbye, and look to Christ. All right, what's the two sons now? Ishmael was the oldest, wasn't he? Fifteen, fourteen years older than Isaac. Ishmael was the oldest. My old man's the oldest, too. My old man is a legalist. Now, a lot of people seem to think that the old nature, the old man, is a, is, a, is a drunkard and a booze hound and a whoremonger and a gambler and a profane swearer. Not always, not necessarily. Not necessarily. The old nature, the, only, the, the, the thing that identifies the old nature is this. It's opposed to God. That's the whole thing. Ishmael was opposed to Isaac. Ishmael, it's either Ishmael or Isaac. They both cannot be heirs. And Ishmael is opposed to Isaac. And the old nature is opposed to God. It may be a clean, morally, outwardly, before me and nature, but it's still opposed to God. You see what I'm saying? That's the reason Christ said it's not that which goes into the mouth that defile it. It's that which comes out of the heart. That's where the root is. That's where the seed is. That's where the sin is. It's opposed to God. And Ishmael's the oldest, and my old nature is a legalist. 
the old nature will try to do something to save itself. Just like the rich young ruler said, Good master, what good thing shall I do to inherit eternal life? He'll make an effort. He's a legalist. He's an Arminian. He's a free willer. He's a worshiper of the flesh. He's a follower of rules and regulations. The old nature, the old Ishmael, just wants a little glory. It does not want to give all the glory to Christ. Ishmael would have been content to take half of the inheritance, half of the birthright. Christ has to have it all. He'll give Isaac a little bit, but he wants some of it. And that's our own nature. It's opposed to the sovereign God. It's opposed to the reigning Christ. It's opposed to the exalted Christ. And he'll take a little grace with works, or a lot of grace with a little work. He'll take just a cabin in the corner of glory. But he wants something. But Ishmael's got to go. He can't even live in the cabin. He's got to go completely. Ishmael is Isaac's enemy. Because Ishmael buys with Isaac for the preeminence. He buys with Isaac for the inheritance. He buys with Isaac for the place of glory. And you'll find this. The most difficult thing in the world for your flesh to do, and for you in the flesh, the flesh can't do it, but for you in the flesh, is to trust Christ completely. That's right. I mean to rest in Christ complete. Job had a hard time. God had to bring him so far down he couldn't look up to bring him to rest in Christ. We, 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 we just, Abraham, cast out the bondwoman and her son. Now, Sarah said that, but God said, Abraham, you do just what she said. It has to be done. And we just, we, we, to die to our self-righteousness and to die to our good works and to die to our, our efforts to please God and to say that I count them but dumb, that's what Paul said. He said, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I had a Hebrew daddy and a Hebrew mama. I was circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin. Considered concerning the law, I was blameless. I was a Pharisee. I was above many of my equals. I did this. I preached. I served God. I did all these things. I count them but dumb that I may win Christ and be found in him. Most of us find our assurance of salvation by the good prayers we pray or the good doctrines we know or the good efforts we put forth or the faithfulness we have to religious duties and not in Christ. And that's Ishmael behind the barn laughing. Christ is, has to have the preeminence. Ishmael has no inheritance. He has no place. He's a slave. He'll always be a slave. He's the son of a bondwoman. He'll always be the son of a bondwoman. He's the son of flesh. He'll always be the son of flesh. And flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So Ishmael has to be forcefully, unceremoniously cast out, thrown out, and never permitted to come back. My, what is Hagar? Hagar is the law. Who is Ishmael? Self-righteousness. The law gave birth to self-righteousness. That's what does it. I pick out a few rules and regulations that I think I can keep, omitting the ones that are harder, and I build me a self-righteousness. I pick out a theory of God or a theory of religion or a theory of the way to walk to heaven, and I do these things, and that gives birth to self-righteousness. And God won't let that live where Christ is. I'm nothing. I'm dung. I'm less than nothing. I'm a worm. I'm a wretch. Amazing grace has saved a wretch like me. Ishmael, get out of here. There's no place for you. Christ is here now. And he's my righteousness and wisdom and sanctification, acceptance with God. Ishmael, you don't even have a toehold. You don't have a place to stand. Get out. And don't come back. The hall of grace. You see what I'm saying? This is the turmoil. And Abraham's home was constant in turmoil as long as that boy was there. And he was hard to part with. He'd been awful close a long time. And he just held to the heartstrings of that dear old man. But that man believed God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. And God said, the bondwoman, the law, and Ishmael, her self-righteous son, has to go. And Abraham said, goodbye. I believe God. I believe God. Application. 
that old man, that old legalist, that old self-righteous, proud self, is going to be somewhere in the vicinity as long as I live. Turn to Genesis 25, 9. He'll even come to my funeral. Genesis 25, 9. I want you to look at this. You know, I don't know why I haven't caught this before, but in Genesis 25, 9, it says, you with me? Genesis 25, 9. And his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him. Old Ishmael came to the funeral. He sure did. And I'm telling you this, that old... You'll never, you'll never be done with Ishmael till you're buried. But he has to be put out. You might have, he might sneak around day after tomorrow and you have to put him out again. But he has to be cast out. The son of the bondwoman and the bondwoman have to be cast out. And he'll be somewhere in the vicinity until you die and are buried and he'll come to your funeral and then that's the last you'll have any dealings with him because in glory it's unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own precious blood. I have a new man in Christ Jesus, a son of God, a child of promise, a miracle birth, the heir of glory in God. I will cast out the bondwoman, law, and her son, my righteousness, and I will cling to Christ. Now then, you won't rest. You rest in Christ. I don't care if you're a babe in Christ, or a young man in Christ, or an elder in Christ. Apart from Christ, you're nothing. You're nothing. You have nothing. Without me, he said, you can do nothing. The branch severed from the vine is only fit for the burning, withered and dead. So Christ is my everything. He's my source of life. Why should I allow Ishmael to pull me down in despair, allow Ishmael to rob me of my happiness and rob me of my rest in Christ? He's going to be around. The old nature is going to be with me till I die, till I'm buried. But why should I allow him to disturb the household? Cast him out. Kick him out. Be done with him. And rest in Christ. And when Satan comes calling and says, You don't deserve to be called a child of God, just tell him I know it. But it, it's a child of, of grace. It's a gift of God. You, 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 you're a great sinner. I know it. And the older I get and the longer I live, the more I know it. Well, God expects this, that, and the other. Well, Christ has already fulfilled everything God expects. Everything God requires. That's the reason I love Christ more all the time. I think more of Him and less of myself, don't you? I'm more sure of Him and less sure of myself all the time. I'm no better fleshly than I was the day God called me. But I've grown spiritually, haven't you? You see what I'm saying? Ishmael's got to go. The motions of sin and the, and the presence of sin. and You'll find out you let that kid live on the place very much longer and God lets you know just how strong he is. He'll let you know something about his presence. But the thing for you to do is cast him out. And watch this. Abraham had to do it, Ed. God didn't do it for him. Abraham had to do it. God could have killed Ishmael, but he didn't. And God could take away all my trust in self and rest in self. He can take away my pride, Jack, right now if he wanted to. But he wants me to do it for his glory and that will reveal my faith in Christ that will bring Christ more glory you get busy now and you kick old Ishmael out you tell him he doesn't belong he's the product of your flesh he's a product of your efforts and your merit he can't live with God's son but I find rest in Christ the son of promise is here our father bless this message we're thankful for this scripture it gives us so much encouragement and assurance and hope how evil must be our best prayers in thy eyes. How evil must be our best thoughts, for they're full of self and sin. But how pure and perfect is that son of promise. No flesh, a miracle of grace. No sin, no rebellion, the son of the living God. He hath all preeminence and all power, and our hope is in him, and our rest is in him, and our acceptance is Christ, and our salvation is Christ. Make this real to every one of us, that we might cease from our labors and enter into his rest, that we might find peace of conscience and heart and spirit, 
Not because of what we've done, because of what we are. We're nothing, but because of what he did. In his name we pray. Amen.